Great timing. Uh, the book uh, went online yesterday evening, Wednesday, um, and I received copies today in the in the mail. Um, it has been downloaded 1,000 times in just 24 hours, which the publisher has said is a is a record. So that's testimony to the obviously the the topic of the book is very hot. Um, the Russia-Ukraine conflict and the consequences for Europe and, and the West. And the aim of the book is more to be like a handbook uh, in Ukrainian, a pidruchnik, um, for use in particularly higher education teaching um, and, um, and a kind of a, a guide more to the basic factors in the conflict. Um, and um, the whole purpose uh, because of that teaching aspect is to shed light on what we think are the key aspects. We approached um, this particular publishing house, E International Relations or E-IR -E Publishing, a British publishing house, because they do a very good job in uh, um, quickly turning the book around. Uh, sometimes books can take up to two years in a publisher. This was done far quicker. And secondly, and more importantly, they provide an online free downloadable PDF of the book, which is great for students. Um, you know, most students are pretty broke these days with loans and everything else. So it's good that they don't have to pay for this textbook. Um, they can download it, hence why, you know, it's already had a thousand downloads. Um, and that downloadable variant uh, can be used in Kindle. Uh, the hardback version, which some people buy, is, is also geared, of course, to libraries. Um, so because it's downloadable, you get far more people reading it. Uh, when you go onto that website, you'll see that many of the books have been downloaded 12, 15,000 times. That's far, far more than a typical academic book, which is like a 2,000, 1,500, 2,000 print run, mainly bought by libraries because they're so expensive. Um, and um, and therefore, you know, students only really use libraries. They don't really buy copies for themselves. So this is a very good way of, of, of as it were, countering Russian disinformation by by ensuring it's available to a mass audience. And and as Canadians, Dutch and Scots are very good uh, and very economical with their money, I'm sure the downloads will be the highest in those three particular countries. Um, it's peculiar for Ukrainian studies because um, I tweeted this morning that somebody should prepare a memo to Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute and the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies explaining to them, explaining to these institutions which still live in the 1980s or 90s, um, what is a Kindle. Um, because these two books, my 2017 and this new one, are the first two books ever in Kindle format in Ukrainian studies. Ukrainian studies hasn't reached uh, the internet, forget social media or Kindle yet. Um, they're still in, I guess, the pre-era. Um, but in not using this modern technology, Ukrainian studies in North America is really failing in its, in its potential ability to reach a massive audience. Um, um, you know, uh, once you have it available in Kindle, which means it's very cheap to buy, my 2017 book is only $6 on Kindle, for example, um, or it's available free like this one, you will reach a mass audience and you really want to spread the message, you want to spread the information. That is the way to do it today. But sadly, uh, social media, video blogs, um, Kindle um, seem to be beyond uh, the Ukrainsky communities, Ukraine communities, and Ukraine studies. The the book is divided into. Um, it's written, co-authored with a very good colleague of mine. I've done quite a lot of joint articles or jointly guest edited uh, academic journals with him, Paul Danieri. Um, he's been interested in Ukraine studies since uh, the 1990s. He was based as an exchange scholar in Lviv University in the early 90s and has kept up an interest. He's now based in California. Um, and he he's good to compliment me because I'm a more a political scientist and he's an international relations theorist. 
Um, and of course, there's a lot of international relations aspects to this book. Um, the book we divided into about five chapters. The first one we review the the Western writing on the on the crisis. This is something I've been doing in a variety of other places um, since 2014. There's been a massive explosion, far greater than any time since 1991, um, of Western writing on the on Ukraine on the crisis. Everybody jumped on the bandwagon. Um, it, the Ukraine-Russia crisis was a sexy topic for many think tanks, maybe some universities. This is a great opportunity to even apply for money, for funding. So everybody became a Ukraine expert, but at the same time, they were not experts. Majority of them had never even traveled to Ukraine, forget going to the front line. Of course, they never used uh, Ukrainian sources, most of them. Um, most Western um, centers for the study of the former USSR and the post-communist world are led by Russianists and those Russianists who are writing about this crisis still continue to use um, Moscow-based sources. Even though in the internet era there is simply no excuse because for example the Ukrainian parliament, president and government all have Ukrainian and Russian web pages um, and the you know, three of the five leading weekly Political magazines in Ukraine are in Russian, they're all online. Uh, the weekly big newspaper, Zerkala Tezhnya, is in, available in Ukraine, Russian, and so on and so on. So there's no excuse, but, but that habit of using primarily sources in Moscow uh, continued, which of course led to much Western skewed writing about the crisis. Um, for example, Western authors citing Putin all the time as opposed to, and never really citing President Poroshenko. So, th so that kind of um, aspect, plus the aspect of uh, some of the Western writing was pretty much pro-Russian or pro-Putin. Um, two groups of these um, uh, authors in the West exist. One um, on the far left, a very curious alliance between the far left in the West um, and, um, and uh, kind of a feeling, a sympathy towards Putin, who's a Russian great power nationalist and a mafiosi. But there you are. Um, but their anti-Americanism leads them to be pro-Putin. Um, we have them in Ottawa. We have them in um, some in the United States, um, um, and in, of course, in Britain, par excellence, Richard Sacco. And then the second group are what would I would call the Henry Kissingerite uh, realists. Uh, Paul Danieri in the book takes these to task and says that they misconstrue and misrepresent the field of realism as one where you have to accept, as it were, Russia's dominance of the region. That's not true. Realism can also mean that you can confront Russia and support Ukrainian's confrontation, uh, a conflict with Russia. But I'll leave that uh, explanation of that whole area to Paul Danieri. Um, besides a literature review, um, as kind of a survey of what's been written in the West, we then look at um, the whole question of information war, fake news, uh, the disinformation, and these kind of areas, which again have become very, very trendy to write about. Many think tanks focus on this question. Um, I've just written, for example, a paper um, for a think tank uh, on the Great Patriotic War and how to counter Russia's propaganda about the Great Patriotic War. And this, um, this area is important because many people seem to assume that Putin invented fake news and disinformation. And this all kind of began in 2014, which is not true. What we try to show in, in the chapter two is that um, this has very deep Soviet um, origins. Um, in the Soviet Union from the 30s onwards, um, the USSR was involved in disinformatia. Um, Anne Applebaum's great book on the Ukrainian famine the last chapter is particularly good about this, about how Soviet leaders from Stalin onwards um, were able to hide the or camouflage or buy people off or use um, fellow travelers in the West uh, to, um, to hide the fact there was this mass famine in Ukraine, including, by the way, somebody who's still recognizes a, a great, you know, element of, of literature in Niagara on the lake, Bernard Shaw, um, 
um, who was a big, big, big fan of Joseph Stalin. Strange that the Ukrainian community has not tried to deal with that question and demand that his name be removed um, as one of the ones who hid Stalin's crimes um, from the West. So that that sort of disinformation and fake news is not a new phenomenon. It's been given greater power by modern technologies and social media, of course, but it has very deep Soviet roots. And one aspect of those of that Soviet roots is um, the Soviets were, and the Tsarist era as well, always attacked Ukrainian nationalism, whether we were Mazepinci, Petloriuci, Banderivci, bourgeois nationalists, fascists, Nazi collaborators, CIA agents, the list goes on. So Putin's focus on us today as fascists is not something new. It has a long, long and deep pedigree. Um, and this was particularly prevalent in the 1970s and 80s against Ukrainian dissidents when Putin was a KGB officer. Um, and this is a time when the USSR uh, created the myth of the Great Patriotic War in 1964. And you can't have the Great Patriotic War without the cult of Stalin. The two go hand in hand. So with the cult of Stalin in Russia, you have de-Stalinization, decommunization in Ukraine. So that, that um, um, we try to show that, um, that it's wrong to, to, sort of, to look at this sort of uh, contemporary Russian information war as something new. It has very deep roots, and it has roots in the people who are running Russia today, the Czechisti, KGB, the Siloviki, the, what Western scholars call a militocracy. So it's, it's a regime, a mafia regime based on great power nationalism and run by former Soviet intelligence officers and military officers. Third chapter, again, we try to show that this crisis didn't begin in 2013, 2014, with, um, with uh, Russia reacting allegedly to the enlargement of the EU and NATO. No, it has very deep roots going back to national identity questions, and Russia has never reconciled itself to Ukrainian independence ever since 1991. Under Boris Yeltsin, there were um, many examples of hybrid war. Hybrid war didn't begin in 2014. Just think of Moldova, Georgia, and Azerbaijan, examples of hybrid war in the 1990s under Yeltsin. Um, but also uh, the Russian parliament in the 1990s on many occasions made territorial claims against the Crimea and against Sevastopol. Russian diplomats and, and security agents were deported from Ukraine for supporting separatism in Odessa, Donbass and Crimea. So this predates Putin. Um, Yeltsin didn't use military aggression against Ukraine, but the, but the unwillingness and inability to recognize Ukrainians as a separate people and, and the country as a sovereign independent state was there all the time. So it has deeper Russian roots than just Putin. If Putin was to go tomorrow, the problem wouldn't go away, in other words. Um, and, and hence what we try to show is that the, the, the history of Russian-Ukrainian relations from 1991 um, is the source of this conflict not the Euromaidan or some mythical, you know, EU-NATO threat. Then chapter four, we look at um, the how Russia annexed the Crimea with the little green man and how Russia manufactured this crisis and conflict in the Donbass, um, how uh, anti-Maidan protesters um, in Donetsk and Luhansk and some other areas um, in January, February 2014, were transformed into an armed insurrection. And this is very important because um, there's still misconceptions that this is somehow a civil war between Ukraine and Russian speakers, which we, which we show is not true. There would not be an armed, armed insurrection if Russia had not stepped in with intelligence support, Spetsnaz little green men, delivery of arms and such like. Um, yes, you had uh, anti-Maidan protesters and many of them were violent in Donetsk and Luhansk. But for example, I visited Donetsk in December 2013 um, and, and in Kharkiv and elsewhere in March 2014. So, you know, these weren't 
such critical places. They only became very critical and extremely violent and leading to the takeover of buildings and taking, to power, taking over of power with Russian help. Without that Russian help, these would have petered out um, and um, Ukraine, it, it wouldn't have moved on to a full-blown military conflict. The, the final chapter written by uh, Paul uh, Danieri is, is about the international ramifications of the crisis um, and how this has led to the biggest um, crisis since World War II in relations with the West, how Russia has seen this crisis, how it's um, intervened elsewhere, how it sees Ukraine as a battleground between itself and the West, um, and of course Russia's interference, in particular in the United States in 2016, what Russia wanted from Donald Trump, um, and if he, when he was elected, some kind of Kissinger-style realist agreement where, whereby Ukraine and the former USSR would be recognized as um, Russia's sphere of influence. Um, now, this is bizarre, to say the least, because this uh, recognition of, an, of a region of the world as one country's sphere of influence could have worked in the Cold War when you had military boots on the ground, or especially in the 19th century with empires. But today, this is absolutely mythical. Um, even if Trump and Putin had somehow reached this agreement where Trump said, we're not really interested in that part of the world. It's all yours. You take care of it. It's yours. So what? That doesn't mean to say the Ukrainians agree with this. Um, how are the Russians going to enforce that on Ukraine? By occupying the entire country? Well, Ukraine's not the size of Georgia or Moldova. You would need half or more of the Russian army at the minimum to occupy the size of Ukraine. This is a big, big place. So, so this is um, fantasy land, but it's fantasy land, sadly, upon which much of Russian policy has been conducted towards Ukraine. We don't see this crisis as ending anytime soon for a variety of reasons. Um, firstly, because we both believe that national identity is at the source of this crisis and national identity doesn't change very quickly. It takes sometimes decades. I, I know this as a British person and, and how the Brits took seven decades to come to terms with Ireland and the Irish. Um, from the 1920s up to the uh, Tony Blair era of the 1990s. Um, and also that um, these grievances in Russia are deep. The, the Russian leadership is angry. They're a declining power, so they're not willing to play by the rules, unlike China, which is a rising power, more willing to play by the rules. Um, and, um, and, and I don't see how... Uh, we don't see how, um, for example, Russia is likely to withdraw from the Crimea sometime soon, especially because the majority of Russians support the annexation of the Crimea, and also because the opposition in Russia is pretty weak um, and hasn't got much backbone. Um, you don't hear much criticism from the Russian opposition about the war in Ukraine, about Putin's aggression, about the imprisonment of 70 Ukrainian political prisoners illegally in Russia. Um, and so when Ukrainians say that Russian liberalism ends on the Ukrainian-Russian border, there's a lot of truth to, to this. Now, again, this is not unusual in, in, in history, and we do a lot of comparative kind of bits of information here. Um, in Western Europe until 1945, you could very easily be a liberal at home and an imperialist abroad. Many British, French and others were, were like that. Um, you could be a liberal in England and you could be imperialist towards India or, 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 or Ireland, for example. And that's true of most Russians. And therefore, um, the, to focus on Putin as a source of this problem is wrong. This problem of Russian unwillingness to accept Ukrainians are separate people and willingness to accept Ukraine as a separate independent sovereign country with the rights to its own to, to decide its own future and destiny um, is far deeper than Putin. Um, and hence we um, are not very optimistic that there's a solution around the corner to this crisis. 
Um, we hope you enjoy the book um, and um, um, with the rate of the downloads, um, which by the way is not just a question of Western students being able to use it, um, it's great for people in Ukraine who don't really have access to Amazon and elsewhere. Um, many, I'm sure, of these downloads have, have been by you people in Ukraine. Um, so let's hope that the book has an impact, particularly in the area of teaching and policy making. Thank you.